deepest human need? Oh gosh, trying to narrow that down. I don't know. Being happy with what you have. It's family, man. That's all you got. Money, career, TV. I think no TV. <laughs> I can't. I can't leave. Love. <laughs> hey, love. TV love. Food. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That was the bottom. Like sex, that. food. <laughs> love, affection. I'll still stick with food. Affection is second. Love. Love. To feel loved. I think it would be love. When I do find out, I'll, I'll let you know. Love is the greatest thing in the world. Love is what the Christian faith is all about. If you ask me for a synonym for the Holy Spirit, the word I would choose is love. Love is the very purpose of our lives. What the Holy Spirit does and brings to our lives is all about love. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. Paul says if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. St. Paul writes to people who are already Christians in Ephesus and he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The original Greek he uses there is in the present continuous tense. It means go on being filled over and over and over again. So it's possible to be a Christian and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. I sometimes use this analogy. We have an old gas boiler with a pilot light. Pilot light's always on, but when the heat comes on, the boiler goes And some Christians are kind of like pilot light Christians, and other Christians are kind of Christians and you can tell the difference when you meet one. So what's it like to experience the Holy Spirit? Whatever the Holy Spirit touches, the Holy Spirit changes. So it is normal that uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit will, will bring some changes, even uh, in our feelings, in our emotions, in our uh, way of expressing ourselves. Uh, St. Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians, don't be uh, drunk with uh, alcohol, with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he, somehow he says that the effect of the coming of the Holy Spirit are uh, <clears throat> like being intoxicated. Uh, but uh, is, be, this is a, a very special kind of intoxication which makes people stable, uh, not, not uh, uh, trembling. It's normal that when, when we first approach the Holy Spirit, that there should be a reaction of our uh, laughter uh, uh, or tears or jumping for joy or speaking in tongues. People have different reactions to the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, which is really the history of the church, volume one, we see five different occasions when people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Five different categories of people. And you may fit into one of these categories. There were those who were longing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You might have seen or heard of people being filled with the Spirit and perhaps you feel today, I'm longing to be filled with the Spirit, to experience God's love for me. Just like the disciples on the day of Pentecost. They've been waiting and praying, longing to be filled. And this is what happened. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So if you're longing to be filled, you will be filled. Then there were those who were receptive. Maybe you're thinking, well, I can't honestly say I'm longing to be, but I'm open. I'm receptive. In Acts chapter 8, there was a group of Samaritans. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that many had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. 
They'd simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So if you're open, you can receive the Holy Spirit today. There are also those who are hostile to the idea of the Holy Spirit. You might be thinking, I don't really like this. I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't really agree with all of this stuff. No one in history has been more hostile than the person who became the Apostle Paul. When Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was killed for his faith, Saul, that's Paul's other name, was there giving approval to his death. It says in Acts 8.3, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So he couldn't get someone more hostile than Saul at that stage of his life. But while he was on the way to Damascus to warn the Jewish synagogues about the Christians, he encountered the risen Jesus. He was temporarily blinded and God spoke to a man called Ananias to go to pray for him. Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. So here was somebody totally hostile who encountered Jesus, was filled with the Spirit and started to go around telling people, Jesus is alive. Jesus is the Son of God. I've encountered him. I love him. I think of a guy called Robert Taylor. He was 41 years old, total atheist, said he'd been to church four times in his life. He'd been to his own wedding, his friend's wedding, and two funerals. He was a guy who's a successful businessman, but unsuccessful in his marriage. He left his wife and two young children. One time he was doing a business deal, and the guy said to him, you know, Robert, have you ever thought about doing the Alpha course at Holy Trinity in Brompton? He said, no, I wouldn't do that, I'm an atheist. Ten days later, he was doing another business deal with another guy, and the guy said to him, you know, Robert, have you ever thought about doing the Alpha Course at Holy Trinity in Brompton? He thought, that's what the other guy said. Maybe I'll give it a go. So he came along. He said he was determined to show everybody else in his small group he was not remotely interested. So this was his opening remark the first night. He said, look, I nearly died of cancer when I was 30 years of age. I find life pretty difficult and not a great deal of fun. As far as I'm concerned, eternal life is the last thing I want. So I really can't see what Christianity's got to offer me. He said that cast a bit of a dampener on the small group. Bruce, who was leading the small group, said, hmm, that's a very interesting point of view. He continued on the course, he came on the weekend, and on the Saturday evening, I remember it so well, on the Saturday evening of the weekend, he encountered Jesus and he was filled with the Spirit. He said he felt this real glow, he had to sit down, he had tears pouring down his face, and he said, that night, I knew I had become a Christian. Everyone said he was beaming like a Cheshire cat. It was two days later, he went home to tell his wife, Kath, what had happened to him. And she said, oh no, Robert, here you go again. First it was scuba diving, then it was tennis, then it was sailing, now he got this, you'll get over it. And he said he was determined to show her that this was different. And she said to him, okay, Robert, if it really has made such a difference, why don't you come back and live with us? So he did, he moved back in. 10 days later, he moved back in with his family. His children thought it was, in their own words, completely fantastic. Robert Taylor's life was completely changed. He'd gone from someone totally opposed, like the Apostle Paul, to someone who was telling other people about Jesus because he'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. Fourth group of people is the uninformed. You might say, well, I was baptized as a baby, or maybe you were confirmed as a child, maybe you've been to church, or even go quite regularly to church. But you say, I've never really heard all this stuff about the Holy Spirit before. Acts 19, one to six says this. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, what baptism did you receive? 
John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. The fifth group is the unlikely. You might be thinking, I don't really think this kind of thing would ever happen to me. You might say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I'm not the religious type. The New Testament world was divided into two groups, the religious, the Jews, and the non-religious, the Gentiles. At this time, all the first Christians were Jews, and most people believed it was impossible to become a Christian unless you first became a Jew. It would have been unheard of to think that a Gentile could be filled with the Spirit. But a Gentile man named Cornelius received a very clear message from God in a vision. And at the same time, a Jewish man, Peter, also received a very clear message from God. And as a result, he ended up preaching the good news about Jesus in Cornelius's house. While Peter was in the middle of a very long sermon, he was cut short. This is how the Bible recounts the events. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, that's the Jewish believers, who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, even on the non-Jews. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So I would say <clears throat> we should not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. I myself, I must confess that the first time I was, I experienced this kind of presence of the Spirit, it was an irrepressible uh, desire of laughter. But I understood that this was a very special kind of laughter. I felt like uh, be, being shaken by the Holy Spirit. So if somebody, uh, well, the first time he approaches the Holy Spirit, uh, feels being shaken, I, I would, would uh, encourage him to, to heal to this because uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of, of joy, of freedom. Where the, the Spirit is, there is freedom, says St. Paul. The Apostle Paul tells us that the experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit is this. It's the love of God. That's God's love for you and for me being poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We don't know exactly what happened, but it seemed that there were physical manifestations of this because Peter says they received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So presumably what happened to them was very similar to what happened on the day of Pentecost. Then there were tongues of fire and the wind of the Holy Spirit. What does that symbolize? Well, fire is like power, passion, purity. And sometimes when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they experience something like fire within them, not literal fire, but people have often said to me things like, I felt this heat in my hands or in my arms, but I knew it wasn't to do with the temperature in the room. I love being outdoors, away from the busyness, noise, pollution of the city. There's something exhilarating about feeling the wind on your face. You just feel alive. The Hebrew word for wind is the same as for breath and for spirit, ruach. And when the Spirit of God comes on a person, it's like the breath of God entering into them. And sometimes there are physical manifestations of that. It's like the eyelids fluttering or breathing in deeply, or even sort of like being blown over by the wind. These things won't necessarily happen, but it's important to mention it in case you do feel or experience something like this and you wonder what it is. It's perfectly normal. It's simply a physical manifestation of something deeper going on in your heart. It's not the manifestations themselves that are important. It really doesn't matter whether you have physical manifestations or not. What matters is what happens in your heart, the experience of God's love for you being poured out into your heart. The cross helps us to understand God's love. Jesus died for you. That's how you know God loves you. We all have a need and a deep longing 
to be loved, to be cared for and wanted. You can have everything in the world or nothing at all, but we all need and want to experience love. It's through the Holy Spirit that we experience God's love for us. This experience releases us to express our love for God in praise. In Acts chapter 10, verse 46, it says, For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Spontaneous praise is the language of those who are, are excited about their relationship with God. St. Augustine said, The thought of you, the thought of God, stirs a person so deeply that they cannot be content unless they praise you, because you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Worship is central to expressing our love for God. And what's amazing is that people across the world worship in loads of different ways. It's almost like worship brings together different voices into a single symphony. Worshiping together breaks down barriers as we come together to express our gratitude and excitement to God. Worship involves all of our being, not just our minds, but our hearts, our wills, and our emotions. And I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world, leading worship in different cultures, contexts, and countries. And I don't think there's one style of expression of worship that is greater than another. Rather, what's key is that people worship and praise God in a way that's real and honest. Jesus wasn't scared of honesty or emotion. He cried in public. He wasn't afraid of exuberance in worship. In fact, he would have probably prayed and worshiped with his hands raised high, which would have been customary for the Jewish people at the time. In fact, the tombstones of the early church depicted them with their hands high in worship. When we experience God's love through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're released to express that love and thanksgiving in praise. In Acts 10, 46, it says that they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And it's as we're filled with the Holy Spirit that we respond in worship. It's an overflow from the inside out. And that is why worship is so powerful and is such a great gift. Sometimes words aren't enough to express how we feel. I don't know whether you've ever wanted to say thank you to someone and found that you don't have the words to adequately express your appreciation. Acts 10, 46 says, for they heard them speaking in tongues. It's like they received a new love language. They were able to express gratitude to God in ways that were not bound by the limitations of language. We see this in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. We see it also in Acts 19. But first of all, it's important to point out that not all Christians do speak in tongues. It's not the mark of being a Christian, nor is it the mark of being filled with the Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit and not speak in tongues. There's no such thing as first-class Christians who speak in tongues and second-class Christians who don't. Secondly, it's not the most important gift. We talk about it on Alpha because it's often one of the first of the more obviously supernatural gifts that people experience. The most famous Bible passage, often read at weddings, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, all about love. But I don't know whether people notice this opening verse. If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul talks about two types of tongues. First of all, human, speaking in tongues in a human language, and secondly, an angelic language. But without love, it's fruitless. We were at an Alpha weekend quite a few years ago now, at, and at the end of the session, there was an opportunity to pray for everybody, and uh, somebody called Penny Burnett was praying for a young woman called Anna. And Penny was praying for her, and then she ran out of English words, so she started praying in tongues for her. And at that moment, Anna suddenly opened her eyes, smiled and laughed and said, you're talking to me in Russian. And Anna actually spoke fluent Russian and she loved the language. Uh, but Penny didn't speak a word. So Penny said, well, well, what am I saying? And Anna said to her, you're saying to me, my dear child, my dear child. And actually that was just what Anna needed to know. She 
didn't feel that God loved her. And if Penny had said to her, God loves you, she wouldn't have believed her or she might have thought that's very nice. But the fact that she said it in Russian, she was saying, my dear child, again and again, in a language that she loved and God had bothered to use Penny to translate this message into a language she loved to tell her that she was a child of God was so profound for Anna and was life-changing for her. Occasionally, we come across human tongues, where someone's been given the supernatural ability to speak another recognizable language. But more commonly, it's not recognizable. It's an angelic tongue. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Paul explains, for those who speak in a tongue, don't speak to people, but to God. In other words, it's a way of expressing what you feel in your heart without going through this process of putting it into a language that you know. There was this guy called Winston. In, in Chinese, he's called Guachai, which means um, cunning guy. He was um, an opium addict. And I, t I, I would tell him about Jesus. And then he started praying in tongues. And he prayed for about half an hour. And I, I actually watched him go through drug withdrawal, no pain. When a baby's born, it starts to cry. And when a, a, somebody comes to Christ, he'll give them a new language to help them get all that stuff out. That's um, all the things we don't know how to say. You, you know, we, we know we're unhappy or depressed or anxious, but we don't always understand why or how to say it. So that's why it's so easy for them to come off years of heroin without any pain, because all the, all the stuff inside comes out. It, it's not that we think it's really important. It's just sort of like a baby speaks at birth by crying. So why not have this at new birth? The context of 1 Corinthians 14 is excessive public use. Paul's making the point, don't constantly be using this gift in every church service. In other words, these people are so excited about this gift of tongues that instead of having a talk in a language they can understand, someone will get up and speak in tongues and say, look, that's hopeless. Better to speak five intelligible words that people can understand than 10,000 words in a tongue. But he said, don't forbid it. In public, there needs to be an interpretation. It's not a translation, but someone needs to say, this is what I think that person was saying through that message in tongues. But in private, Paul encourages the use of tongues. In fact, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Singing in tongues is slightly different. He says, I'll pray with my spirit and I'll sing with my spirit. Whereas praying out loud in tongues is really, generally speaking, a private activity that should be done on our own, singing in tongues can be a corporate activity. It involves us all. We have to listen to one another as we sing together. And it's often a, a very, very beautiful sound as people are praising God together from their hearts. I like, I join very, very with, play, with joy uh, singing in tongues. Speaking in tongues, I know it's a, a gift of the Spirit. It is a way of getting uh, beyond our schemes, our concepts and words, uh, to uh, go beyond our limit, to re uh, relate with God in a way that is spiritual. Of course, th this is a gift which uh, <clears throat> as a natural support. So there, there is some, even uh, in poetry or in, in, in the paintings, there is something when you go beyond the, the, for the, the, the images and it's a way of speaking in dogs, which means going beyond the lines and, and the, 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 the contours and getting free. So it's an experience of freedom. It's a powerful tool, especially in some occasions, for, for uh, um, imploration, for affirming authority uh, upon a, a situation. Uh, it's a special gift for adoration. So, would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? In my experience, there are three barriers to people receiving. The first is Doubt. Doubt goes like this. I don't think that if I asked, I would receive. 
Jesus says this in Luke 11 verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. And you can see the disciples think, hmm, not sure. So he goes on, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And they're going, yeah, maybe, maybe my friend, maybe my neighbor, maybe the person sitting next to me, but not me. So Jesus goes on, for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You can see the disciples saying, okay, okay. But then the next thing, the next barrier is fear. Okay, I believe I would receive, but I'm not sure I want it. What would happen? Would something terrible happen to me? If I ask, will God give you something terrible? Jesus says this, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, he says basically you're a pretty evil bunch, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give you something terrible. He's going to give you something amazing and wonderful, the Holy Spirit. Third barrier to receiving is inadequacy. It goes like this. Well, I'm not worthy. You don't know what my life is like. That's true. I don't know, but God does. And he loves you. He goes, I'm not, I'm not mature enough. I haven't been a Christian long enough. I, I can imagine that God would give it to a really good person or a really mature Christian, but not to me. But Jesus doesn't say, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to a really mature Christian or someone who's led a really good life? He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, shall we ask him? What we're going to do now is simply invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill anyone here who would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray a very simple prayer, come Holy Spirit. It's the most ancient prayer in the church. And one way that we can, we can say to God, there's a little symbol that we open our hands as a way of saying, Lord, I, I'm open to receive. It's the opposite of this, which is, don't come anywhere near me. This is a way of saying, saying to God, Lord, I'm open today to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to pray that very simple prayer right now. Come, Holy Spirit.